Okay. It's one o'clock. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so, so much for joining us today uh, on this very, very, very special day. Today is Give Miami Day, and it's an incredibly important day for Aerie as we are fundraising to continue to support artists in the Everglades. Um, I've put some information in the chat, if you're willing, able to donate, to share. We're aiming to raise $20,000 today. Um, and each donation over $25 is matched by the magical people at the Miami Foundation. So we want to say thank you so much to the Miami Foundation. Um, and thank you to everybody for considering donating and sharing and supporting us in this journey. And um, so today I'm really, really, really excited um, we are going to have a talk with Onajide Shabaka, um, who was an Airy Fellow in 2015, and he is going to be returning for Airy's first alumni residency tomorrow, um, which is very, very exciting. And uh, talking with him is somebody who's known him for a very long time and somebody we love dearly, Esther Park, who is um, an Airy board member. So um, I'm going to hand it over to them. I'm going to stop sharing now. And um, also, I just wanted to thank all of our sponsors and partners, especially the Everglades National Park, for, um, for all their support um, and providing the magical landscape in which our artists are able to interact with. So thank you so much. So Esther, Onajide, hello. Hello. How's everyone doing? Gide, you're still on mute. <laughs> Here we go. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Gide. How are you? I'm doing all right. So um, before I get started and ask you very deep and philosophical questions about your practice, I want to ask you, how, how have you been coping? How has this year been for you, I mean, have you been going out partying? No, I'm, I'm joking. You're probably not going out partying. <laughs> no, I'm not a party person. Never have been my entire life. Never really have been. Um, um, I have been, well, you know, I started um, sequestering myself back in the middle of February because I was doing another residency up in Georgia. And so I was in a house by myself for two weeks before oh. the, the national quarantine got put in place. So I was already, you know, by myself. And of course, you know, coming back to my studio, you know, I'm here by myself most of the time. And so even to this day, mostly I go out for groceries if I have a doctor's appointment or, you know, some other, you know, post office, you know, I mean, I went to two events, which was Yanira's opening and Christina Peterson's opening or closing. So those are the only two events that I went to, but they invited me. Otherwise I did haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> but it's funny that you're saying, cause a lot of your work is, I would say it's in solitude. Um, you know, you have this kind of um, ongoing walking practice, which I, I would love for you to kind of explain a little bit to our audience. Um, it's not like you're doing a lot of collaborative work where you have, you know, 10 people in your studio working on a piece. So it's almost like COVID was business as usual for Onajide. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. Yeah, I've had a walking practice, of course, when I didn't when I first started it, I didn't call it that because I didn't know of any such thing. I started it when I was in high school. So, you know, that's going back to the 1960s, you know, I mean, that's a long time ago. And, uh, but in terms of my health, you know, as much as they're talking about walking for the aged, <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I've, been doing that. I've been doing that all my life. So, you know, I right. mean, it's just, a natural thing for me to do. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I, I walk in 
a lot of, you know, by myself most of the time. And, you know, I'm always looking around, looking on the ground, looking at the trees, looking at the birds. You know, I mean, that's what I do. Mm. And, you know, I mean, it's just a natural thing. You know, I mean, I just walk and look and find things and explore. And, you know, I mean, that's basically how my art practice has unfolded. Do you, and when you do these walking, um, I guess these walking meditations, do you go with a sense of purpose? Like, hmm, like today I'm going to identify birds or I'm going to, you know, see what's lying on the ground or, or is it just kind of like you in the moment and see what happens? No, you have to be in the moment because you can't expect something is going to be there waiting for you. Right. You know, I mean, I know that there are, for instance, uh, water snakes, there's a canal behind me. Mm. I mean, I, I have only seen one, but I mean, it was really a beautiful brown water snake. I mean, it was just amazing that I happened to walk along the edge of the canal that day and there it was on the rocks. Mm. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen it. Mm. But you know, I was actually looking for something else. I was looking for, you know, the possibility of seeing the manatees because they had been there or some other kind of fish that, you know, but at that particular time, I believe it was a lot of manatees were, you know, transversing back and forth in the canal. Mm. And, um, but, you know, you just go and just, you know, whatever's there and that's it, you know, mm. <laughs> nature provides. To, yeah, no, before we kind of dive into your um, residency at Airy that you're starting tomorrow and God bless you because the weather is amazing. So I know last time we were doing a tech run, it was like Hurricane Etta's, you know, feeder bands that were completely doing a deluge here in Miami. But now that um, the tides have shifted and we have gorgeous weather. Um, but I do want to talk, I, this is a personal selfish question because G-Day, I've known you for so long. You're such a staple in the Miami artist community. You've given so much to this, you know, to the city, to the artists, you know, near and far. Um, but it's funny because I only know G-Day, the Miami G-Day, but I know you have a deep history starting, you were born in Ohio, am I right? Yes. And what brought you to Miami? Well, I, my family moved to California in 1957 from Ohio. And I had elderly relatives, you know, my grandfather had two siblings that were still living in Fort Pierce. Oh. Because that has come up quite a bit in my art practice, Fort Pierce as a place. Mm. And um, so I actually moved to Fort Pierce before I moved to Miami. Mm. And, you know, Fort Pierce at that time was a lot smaller and a lot less to do. And, you know, when you're from a a more urban environment, you know, it's like, well, what am I going to do? So, of course, at that time, I also had moved away or stepped back from, I was on hiatus from art making because of racism. Oh, so, expand. Let us know how that goes. Uh, well, let me finish about how I got to my Oh, head. okay. Fair. And Go so, you know, I wanted something to do. And so I started with the idea of racing bicycles of all things. And so I moved to Miami because, you know, I got a job offer here and boom, I moved to Miami and I raced for, you know, like 12 years in total, something like that. I mean, not 12, uh, sorry, nine years. I raced for nine years. Like, as in like Tour de France? Like bicycles? Yeah, bicycles. Oh, yeah. really? Yes. Like long distance? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I did. So why don't you do a bicycle tour instead of a walking tour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I raced in Jamaica, I raced in Puerto Rico, and um, Dominican Republic. There was a race there in February at their national, it was their national so called tour. And it was a week long. And then after the race, and I would spend a couple of days there on my own. Uh, because, you know, their federation paid for everybody's flight to get there, you know, the Olympic Committee. And I, you're an Olympian. Who knew? And so I made friends with 
the national coach of the Dominican Republic. And so I stayed in his house for like three days and then I'd come back home. After Look at the that. Break. Yeah. So and, you could have uh, been an Olympian bicyclist instead of a famous artist. Uh, yeah, but I had started too late for that, unfortunately. Um, well, no, no, going back, you were saying you took a hiatus. So you did go to art, art college, correct? Right. I went to um, some smaller schools. I went to LA Harbor College. It's part, it was, at that time, it was a two-year school. Then I went to Art Center, this, you know, one semester. Then I went to California College of the Arts, and I went there for three semesters. And then, you know, I just kind of got fed up with the art world because, you know, San Francisco at the time was very racist. You know, I mean, you always have situations with young people going into galleries. And of course, you know, this is in the 60s, 70s rather, 70s where, you know, well, how does, you know, you approach the gallerist and say, how does an artist approach a gallery for uh, exhibition or representation? I mean, this is a question. They don't talk about that in school. Oh, they right. didn't, they didn't. Right. So, you know, I asked the question and this one famous artist whose name I won't mention, you know, basically said, what the F do you want in this place? Yeah, I mean, it was really, really nasty. How old were you? Oh, I, you know, in my 20s, early right. 20s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I had, you know, my bachelor's degrees in photography. Mm. And so, you know, San Francisco, I partially the reason why I went there was because of uh, the photography group F64 and Edward Weston and, uh, Brett Weston and you know all those people that were into this kind of uh, pristine black and white photography. This mm -hmm. was the mm -hmm. so-called mecca of photography in the United States at that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, is G Day frozen? Oh, he's frozen. It was getting juicy too, man. Oh, it was getting real juicy. I know. I'm oh. coming. I'm coming in to save you from the. Um, You're not G Day. Freeze. I know. I I I wish I was this epic artist and I could share some wealth, of, <laughs> but um, but I can't. I'm I'm filler, Esther. I'm just filler for you, right? Yeah. This is a commercial break, guys, where we uh, you know, talk about the weather. Um. Okay. Well, let's um for our participants. In the uh, oh oh, and he left gone. us on a G day. So All right, so let's hope he signs back on. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna wait a minute. But Esther, why don't we talk about why we love Airy? Yes, to share with everybody else here. So so you know, okay, everyone in the chat, who loves artists? Click say yes in the chat. Or no, if you don't love artists. Oh, I wasn't expecting that, but of course. Yes. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah saying yes. yes. That's Who else loves caps. artists? That's an all caps yes, too. No one else loves artists? I mean, come on. Oh, no. I, I think they do. Yes. Oh. All right. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, I sleep wow. with an artist. Ooh, I Jane see. says, I love artists. Yes, yes. Okay, idea. so great. Okay, now the bigger question, who loves the environment? I'm gonna I'm gonna put my hand up right here. I, I, I love the environment. Also yes. Valerie Ricordi, I believe in the power of artists and art. Thank you, Valerie. Yes. yes. Randy Berman says yes, but it depends. <laughs> that's Don't a valid you? question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why if you said yes to both loving artists and the environment, that's why we love Airy. Yes, and that's why yes. it's very important that we can continue to do what we do, yes. right? Esther is like bring more artists into the Everglades, help them connect like, with nature, help like this amazing G Day, who I hope his internet comes back on so he could talk about this. It was getting real good, guys. The tea was hot. I was like, 
Tell us who this guy was in the chat. <laughs> who is he? Who is he? No, and he's going like tomorrow too. Oh, I just got a text message, everybody from. Um, okay. He said his hotspot died. Oh. You be right back. Yes. <laughs> back. Okay. Sorry, I'm, but... I'm gonna sign <laughs> out. Okay. My Wi-Fi died, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, that's all I have is a hotspot, so it died. Oh, G-Day, I thought, you know, I thought you logged off because it started getting real juicy. <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh, he was like, I'm about to get real hot. And then, boop, and I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway. Go on, tell, feel the story, yeah. tell us, tell oh, us. I, so I decided I was going to get into fashion design. So I oh. was doing African and Asian based design work, but you know, contemporary. And so I was, got involved with some, cause my brother and sister still, you know, have these kind of pop-up selling situations and, um, you know, artifacts and, you know, like my brother sells like the shea butter and the, the mm -hmm. African soap. And so, you know, I had connections to get imported cloth from Africa and Asia. And of course, living in San Francisco, then, you know, Nixon opened, reopened China. And so then there was a lot of the Chinese fabrics coming in. So, you know, there was a lot of textiles available. So I said, I'm going to make clothes. But, you know, my clothing design business was also political because I was writing up these political statements about, you know, what these clothing, you know, wearing African clothes meant to me. I mean, you were also at the time at, during the 60s and 70s, like Oakland was a hotbed, you know, for essentially civil yeah. rights, Black Panther movement, you know, so. Um, well, and then also yeah. my brother was part of the US organization with Ron Karenga, you know, mm -hmm. who founded the uh, Kwanzaa, you know, he was kind of involved with him for a while. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, yeah, so going back, so after that kind of interaction with this gallerist or artist who shall re re rename, uh, remain nameless, um, you were just kind of like, I'm going to give up the art world or kind of pursuing this career as like a full-time thing or how did that kind of transpire? Well, no, I, I was working in banking. I had a part-time job when I was in college and, you know, I kept that job even while I had my store. So I was working in, in the data center at night. So I had my store in the daytime and a data center at night. Got it. All right. So then you come to Miami, you're kind oh, of immersed. Hold, hold, hold on a second. So now I got back into the art thing. So I was, yes. so I was still, this was back in the bicycle racing. I'm in okay. Italy, right? Okay. And I, because I had a job there, but I was also racing with a company that, you know, was partially based in Miami that was doing these tours, but it was also available for people who wanted to go there for two weeks to do a, a, a bicycle racing in Italy because it was different than here. Still is European racing is a little different than here. Of course, and, yeah. And so I was there and I said, you know, this place has me inspired to do art again. So I said, mm. once I finish with this, I'm gonna go back to making art, whether whatever oh, yeah. happened. And so that's so, how I got. So it was Italy that kind of reignited your passion and yeah. in making art. And then what was the first things that you started making? Do you re recall? Was it like photography again? Was yeah, it like- photography. Yeah, photography. Yeah. But you know, I, still I was thinking of, you know, photography in a sculptural sense. Mm. because I was building photographs mm. in a sense. And, you know, but also collage. So I was doing a lot more collage. I wasn't doing that before, mm. but I started doing that with the photographs, cutting up old photographs with new photographs. And um, the former director of the museum in Vero Beach was very helpful. You know, we sat down and had a lot of private conversations about, you know, how to move forward. 
Mm. You know, he was very helpful about a lot of things. You know, I remember um, when they had the Florida Arts Council meeting at the museum mm -hmm. there. And, you know, he told me, I want you to be here on such and such a day. And, you know, because I, I was part of a show. And he said, I want you to do an, you know, do your, your end of your sculpture, but, you know, take all day to do it. Because while the Arts Council is going on, I want to introduce you to people when we have our breaks. And so mm -hmm. that's what I did. And so, you know, he was very helpful about that. And that's also where I uh, was, I, I had a Florida Endowment of Humanities grant. And that's where I did it there at that museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, just again, knowing your practice and knowing your work and having seen your work, um, there's also this kind of like, you're creating a story you know, particularly when you're saying you co you're you're collecting, right? You're archiving. There is this moment of like you're also discovering, like you're kind of like a investigator. Um, yeah. And I'm just curious how that process came about. Was that just you as a very inquisitive person, or was that also just finding a subject that really intrigued you and you kind of wanted to dive deeper, but with an artistic lens or how did that come about? That's a good question. I mean, I guess it comes mostly from reading. You know, I've always been a, a reader, more, more nonfiction than fiction. But you know, there's these, I, I remember when I first learned how to read hmm. and I was an avid reader and I used to go take my brother's books who's older than me and devour his books and I was going oh my god I can read these books these books are more difficult than my books but these oh this is wow this the, the world is open mm. you know and so I guess it really kind of came from that and I've always been a heavy reader you know mm. I mean that's probably the one thing that I've lugged around all my life <laughs> that's a books. pain in the butt is <laughs> So probably from that, but you know, you I, a, I like I like to do research. Yes, I like research. yes, you're a research artist for sure. Yeah, yeah. And but you, but similarly, how you love books, you also love nature. You're right. And I wanted since this is an Aries talk, and you are an Airy artist. Um, what is your relationship with the Everglades? I mean, how obviously living in F South Florida, you're kind of immersed in it, but you know, do you have any early experiences going and visiting the Everglades on your own? Have you done your own walking um, visits I, I with the Everglades? The Everglades or? Um, it's a little bit far for me right now because I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. um, but when I first moved to Florida, when I first actually visited Florida, the mangrove trees just like, wow, mm. blew my mind. Yeah because I had never seen anything like that before. Yeah, actually, um, Helen did remind us that you have a presentation that um, we could possibly pull up as a share screen and we could see some of your works. Okay. So Helen, behind the scenes, Helen. All right, here we go. So when I was there before, mm. um, one of the things that I was really interested in was um, trying to look at the night sky and photograph the night sky, but you know, there's a lot of light pollution and you know, the light gets refracted through the clouds and it was quite a bit of rain back then, 2015. So I wasn't able to get really too many photographs. I got a few. And then the one next to that, that kind of looks like the, uh, the highwayman painting. And, uh, and I took it because it looked like a highwayman painting. And um, that, you know, there's a relationship there with Alfred Hare's father having married my uh, grandfather's youngest sister. So even though I didn't know Alfred, he was killed before I ever knew who he was. But you for know, those, I'm not familiar. Can you explain who Alfred Hare is? Alfred Hare was one of the main people who uh, learned to paint from Beanie Bacchus and taught other people how to paint. Oh. So he was one of the main people, him and Harold Newton, they were the two main people. Got it. 
because they didn't go, they didn't want to work in agriculture because all you know, the canning houses because basically that's all Fort Pierce had for a long time was you know migrant agricultural workers. But you you're know. saying this is not a highwayman painting. It just it represents or it looks kind of like a highwayman. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of that's the kind of the way they paint. You know, with the they paint mm. like the Florida um, the pines. Right. Or sometimes with the palm trees, but you know they always have this kind of dramatic sky, mm, mm -hmm. and of course they use a lot of colors that are not natural colors to that. But you know I, I thought it looked like one of their paintings, so that's why I took the photograph that particular day. I have a bunch of others too. <laughs> and what about these other images? And then the 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 one with the skull was a bear skull that was actually in the room where I was staying. And the one up to the <laughs> left of that was um, a representation of some European people who had apparently no idea what a real alligator looked like. And so this was like um, <laughs> colonial fantasy. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know. And you can go to the next one. And so these are some of the things that I saw. There are a lot of deceased animals, mm -hmm. um, either you know, natural or sometimes run over. You know, there's a little that little snake, the smallest one there, got run over. Um, the owl, you know, was I saw the owl on a regular basis up in the trees, mm -hmm. really close by. And um, you know, you can get close to animals there if you're quiet. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, really nice, and I know uh, Jason That's Hedges went and did his residence right after mine, and he went to some of the same areas that I went. But you know the animals, you know they they move around depending on, you know the water flow and the the time of year and stuff. You know because they're migratory, mm. and so he saw things that I didn't see, but we were in kind of the same areas. So you know. That's what, one of the things that I'm hoping to see this time is what's going to be different in terms of the animal population. Because Were you guys I, there around the same time, though? Um, I was there in September, and he came in in October. Oh, so yeah, you were. Yeah. Huh. And what is that, a wasp or a bee? Um, that's a wasp. It's a paper wasp. So they, you know, when they die, they're, they're the outside, you know, the exoskeleton. And, oh, wow. you know, just dry, you know, a lot of, you know, when they die, they just die, you know. So I picked up some, you like to do macro photography. So I did these close-ups. And was this picture. like part, was this part of a series? Um, just, no, just picking up things and photographing them. You know, like the, the upper left-hand corner with the snake skeleton. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I photographed it. And you know, I left it there because that's the motto or the actually the not the motto, but that's what the park system has installed in terms of their regulations now is um, you know, you don't bring anything in there and and leave it. You know, you take all right. your trash out with you and what's there you leave there, including, you know, dead leaves and everything else, you know. Right, right. Just leave it. You know, I so mm. I picked up stuff photograph stuff and then put it back. The the one turtle there that you see the shell, that was actually in the middle of the road. So I stopped and picked it up, photographed it. I turned it over on the other side, photographed it, and then put it over on the side of the road and went on because otherwise it would have gotten run over. Hmm. Are there more images? Oh, yes, there are. Yeah. And wow. so, you know, then there's, um. The upper left, there's some, uh, I think that's alligator dung or poop, whatever you want to call it. And people have asked me, you know, why I take pictures of poop. And <laughs> part of the, you know, but it's important if you're in a wilderness area, you definitely want to know what is there. Because you're not going to, all those animals will not let you know that they're there. But if you see, poop and kind of identify it, then you know what's around. So right. I know, I, because I, you know, I also go to Minnesota and I've seen wolf scat. I've never seen a wolf in the wild, but I've seen wolf scat. So I know there are wolves 
around the area where I visit. Question, uh -huh. how, were you like a boy scout growing up or did you, how, were, were you like an avid camper? Like, how do you know all of these things, even though you were saying you kind of lived in an urban setting? Well, you know, my, my father, bless his heart, excuse mm -hmm. me, I'm getting kind of emotional because he's going to be 98 in December. Oh, wow, bless, and, bless. Um, but, uh, you know, he took us camping. He took a lot of kids camping as a group. Yeah. And um, it, was, it was good. It was fun, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, there was some kind of influence, but I don't know exactly how that all transpired mm. uh, because he didn't really get into talking about the animals and all that kind of stuff. You know, he was more, yeah. for him, it was more about giving the kids something to do out of the city and um, just kind of a recreational activity, you know. Right, yeah, our yeah, family, yeah. Our family went up to the mountain. We went up at the, we didn't go to Yosemite, but we went to Sequoia a number of times. Oh, wow. You know, and, and rented cabins and, you know, cooked over an open fire and, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, it was fun. That's so fascinating too, because, you know, one of the biggest, I guess, the biggest kind of eye-opening experience during the last couple years and you know particularly this year with um, Black Lives Matter is this idea that that nature is kind of like looked upon as very white and very monocultural you know this idea that it's not very inclusive um, you know even if you're looking at statistics like if you're um, seeing the the kind of the stats of um, national park rangers, I think it's literally less than 2% are people of color that work in the national parks. And it's fascinating to hear this, you talking about your dad and how your dad took you guys camping and stuff, because you obviously didn't experience that. You didn't see any um, barriers of entry. Am I right? Um, Being somebody of color going no, to these not, parks or? Not really. No, I, I, I didn't. I mean, I know that, um, I know it exists, but, you know, we didn't, you know, my family in particular didn't, mm. you know. And I'm just, when you say, you know, it exists, what, so wh why do you think that is though? Well, it's, I know we're veering, I know we're kind of going in a well, tangent. It's, it's but. colonialism, it's people think that they own the land, you know, this land belonged to a native population and you know we're settlers we're settlers on this land you know mm -hmm. even though thank god the election is over with but you know i mean a lot of people think mm. still think that this land belongs to them because they took it from somebody with a gun mm. mm -hmm. you know hmm. interesting okay um, sorry you know, going back to a go, no go ahead sorry no, but you know, that's, you know, I mean, I've, I've run across people like that. I mean, I've talked to people like that, but I mean, because I don't have any guns on me, so there's no, um, you know, I don't get in those kind of conversations when I'm out in the, in the wilderness area. Usually I'm around more science oriented people. Right. And, um, you know, so we're looking at, you know, the ecological environment or looking at the flow of the water, whether it's here or again in Minnesota, because I go there quite a bit. And, um, you know, looking at beetle infestations and, you know, stuff like that, you know, I mean. Yeah. There's, but hunting, it is... there's hunting, but you know, the people that I'm around are right. not hunters. Right. But it is, it is interesting though. I remember, I don't know, it was it like a passing conversation that I had with you, or maybe I overheard, but you know, when you're talking about your kind of your walking practice, you know, you obviously are very self-aware that when you're walking in certain areas, right, you must be kind of on guard mm -hmm. for obvious for obvious reasons of how you look and how other people perceive you. And that is interesting what you're saying about nature and this idea of like territory and private property and this idea that like, oh, we're not supposed to go there because we don't quote own that land. Um, and the fact that you were able to kind of, or your parents really, your father was able to kind of 
you know, take that mentality and that idea and say, no, this land is everyone's land. Yeah. Like everyone can go. So um, it is kind of this mental block that I think some folks do have um, about this idea of access. Well, but, you know, you know uh, uh, the Green Book, the, a lot of people know about the Green Book now, but, you know, our yes. family, when we went to California, we didn't get in the airplane and fly there. Very few people were flying at that time in the 50s and 60s. That's that was like wealthy people. Right. Uh, we got in a car and we drove, you know, Route 66. <laughs> that's how we got. <laughs> that's how we got there, you know. Yeah. Hopefully you had a green book with you when you yeah, were my, driving. My through. He had one. He said he wished he still had it, but you know, yeah. he got it a long time ago. But yeah, but you know, we I had experiences of people calling me nigger and um, mm. not being able to get served in a restaurant, um, being denied a bed to sleep in at night and having to drive 20 miles out of the way to find a place to sleep. Mm. You know, like those places where they put the the tray, uh, A&W root beer used to put the tray on the window. And so, you know, they would sell us the, the food, but we could not even sit in their parking lot and eat. We had to drive down the road to eat it in mm. the dark. Mm. Yeah. Whether you could buy gas at this station or that station. Yeah. You know, all those issues that you have to deal with, mm. you know. Well, hopefully nature is not that bias, I can say. <laughs> I can say for a fact, nature does not care. Um, okay, moving on. We have these beautiful, what are these, watercolors? Yeah, some watercolors I did, yeah. Gorgeous. Can you explain some of these? Are there anything um, that stick out for you? Um, I, I like all of them. <laughs> but um, the one on the lower left that looks like mud with the uh, seashells. That's also watercolor. I mean, uh, snail shells. And I just kind of, that's actually was done from a photograph. So I did, um, I did a drawing on the paper, but the image that's there is a photograph. Mm. And then Got the, it. the photograph that's above the, um, the mosquito was from Sandfly Island. And that was, you have to access that from the Gulf. So I went over to Everglades City mm. and went with one of the Everglades tours around some of the little barrier islands there. That was fun, except a lot of sandflies, but it was nice. <laughs> the, the tide was really, really powerful. You know, the tide could just pull you out. Wow. All right, next slide. I think this is the last one. Oh. Here we go. And, what is um, this? So, uh, so I made these two images a little bit larger because um, the one on the bottom was the one that I donated to the park system, which oh, was, um, it's like fresco. Yeah. Uh, it's like plaster. I did watercolor and on plaster with some drawings. Again, thinking about the night sky and, you know, how, without thinking about the Greek designation for star configurations, I mean, what other kinds of ways would the uh, a native population how would they see the alignment of the stars mm. because the animals are different than some of the animals that you find in Europe so that's what I mm. did there but on my very last day um Is that I was a cat no that's a panther oh that's a panther <gasps> so yeah we were I was with the rangers and we were going around to the various habitats because the Everglades is not just one habitat, it's several habitats. So we were going around looking at various plants and the flow of the water and the driver stopped on the side of the road for whatever reason, I don't know, we were talking. Yeah. So it was, it was two, two park rangers, a ranger from uh, Columbia who was visiting and myself. And all of a sudden I look out the window and I'm going, is that, a, is that a panther? <laughs> and it came out of the swampy area toward the back and kind of looked at us, looked down the road, looked back at us, and then just kind of ran across the road in front of us. Wow. And it was only about 10 feet, which is about three meters. 
you know, for us metric people. <laughs> and um, just kept going wherever it's going. So we were probably, you know, in its normal path of wherever it was going. That's now, amazing. Need, they, they need 200 square miles of wow. territory each. That's a lot. Wow. But this it's, was, a, it was in the daytime. Ahead. So, you know, it was very unusual to see it in the daytime. That is very unusual. I remember going in the Everglades. We, I did a camping trip one time and, you know, you know, us, it was a bunch of women actually. And we're all just like, what do, what do we do if we see a panther? And the ranger was like, take a camera because the, the, uh, the ratio of you seeing a panther during the day is so rare that you need to take a camera and take it. And here you go. You literally capture this. This is pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, it was so. just totally amazing. Actually, um, this is in the, the big Cypress side of uh, 41. Oh, so there's, so that it. road there, you see where he's walking from. Somebody owns that piece of property because there are people who were living there before oh. the park became a park. And they have been grandfathered land rights. Wow. So, you know, they are the people that are out there can stay there. Wow. But nobody else can move in. Wow. I had no idea. So we have a couple questions. Um, for those that are tuning in, please uh, put those in the Q&A chat. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee asking, how has your residency at ARI impacted your practice? Uh, I mean, all of the residencies I do impact in some way. I mean, how specifically? I don't know. I guess just make Florida more intimate because every part of the state is a little bit different. And so, you know, like I said, when I first moved to Florida, you know, I'm in St. Lucie County, and there's a lot more pine trees there and a lot more uh, mangroves, and, but that doesn't happen in the, in the Everglades. So, you know, the, the landscape is different. Mm. And the animals are different too. Right. Um, okay, another question. Does Ona Gide, that's you, Gide, <laughs> feel artists have a responsibility to protect the environment? We all have a responsibility to protect the environment, but you know, obviously capitalism is more important for a lot of people than protecting the environment. You know, I mean, I, I pick up trash and I identify, unfortunately, you know, I think I focus too much on the invasive species because, you know, I, I look and I see the invasive, you know, and I get, oh yeah, right. I got to remember the, cause somebody was asking me, is this native, is this native? And I'm going, mm. I'm identifying the, the invasive stuff, you know, mm. mm -hmm. because there's so much of it, not just um. animals, but plants too. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. You, so you're going to be in the Everlay starting tomorrow. Are you, is there any thing that you're kind of um, worried about because we were seeing earlier about just climate change and how, you know, this time it's, it's this time this year, like temperatures are, are definitely higher than usual. Humidity levels are higher than usual. Is it something you as kind of the science brain, are are kind of concerned about uh personally yeah in general well I both think, i guess but well i'm you know i think because we've had so much rain i think there's going to be a, an excess of mosquitoes yes so that is you know depending on where i am that could be problematic and of course there are saltwater mosquitoes and freshwater mosquitoes so you know there's two different you know two different species that you're going to have to deal with and both suck let's just but, be honest you know, i think it'll i think it'll be all right you know i mean you know they have and i bought one when i was in minnesota i bought one of those headgear things that with the that's like <laughs> a, a net uh-huh the jacket oh. there in the in the cabin that's like netting Yes. So, you know, you yes. can go out 
you can go out like that. So it's okay. I feel like G Day, you can go to like anywhere. Have you ever seen this show called Naked and Afraid? No. On Discovery. I think you should be a contestant. Just saying. <laughs> um, it's like where they place two people and they're just literally like they're stripped away of clothes. They have two sets of tools and they're in the middle of whatever wilderness in like zambia or like cambodia and they have to survive 22 days oh. out there i'm just saying since we we're learning so much about you okay. olympiad bicyclist and now scientist and um what else do you do astronomy like what's going on <laughs> um all right we have we have another question this is by Tracy Carter Robertson, our chair, a fun chair at Airy. This is a long one, but I'm going to read word for word. It says, as a fellow Northern Californian and also inspired by cyclist Major Taylor. Do you know who Major Taylor yes, is? Yes, yes. All right. The first Black sports superstar in 1899. Wow. Who broke barriers to enter into the world of cycling um, during the Jim Crow era. And then she writes, I love that Esther, that nature is not biased and does not care. But can you speak a bit more about your experience as an ethnobotanist and Aries role in Everglades of dispelling the myth of why is the image of an environmentally conscious African-American still hard for us to picture? And that was a direct quote from the New York Times, June, 2019. Hmm. Um. Any I just question? think it's hard just in general. I mean, when you think about the history of this country, the legacy of this country, and and so many African Americans in poverty, you know, to think about going off on a on a walk somewhere like I would have done, I mean, they're gonna ask me, you know, my community would ask me, are you crazy? You know, mm -hmm. because who has time for that? Mm. You know, I mean, like I said, you know, my parents were, I, I don't know, you know, forward thinking about that, you know, and I'm just blessed that, you know, that I had parents yeah. like that. Well, also, we're super blessed that you're existing because clearly that spirit of generosity and this idea of, of you know, how you're able to see the world has transpired to so many people through your art. So obviously, you know, your parents' legacy is continuing forward with your practice and man, bless your father, 98. Yeah. Good on him. Hopefully he gets another 20 years. <laughs> so well, mentally he's doing okay. Physically he's got some issues, but you know, yeah, no, but what a blessed life. That's a, that's pretty amazing. Um, I think we're nearing the end of this uh, Aries Ask. I do want to give a another reminder that today is Give Miami Day. So please, 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 whatever you do, oh, check the chat, click the link, give what you can. Um, as you know, Miami Foundation does a match. So um, if Again, if you love artists and you love the environment, you need to donate to Aerie. <laughs> um, Jide, any last words for this group? Any parting gifts? Oh, I don't know. I'm just, you know, kind of looking forward to, but I, I don't have any expectations, but I right. look forward to it. Because like I said, you know, you can't, you know, like plant things on a trail and then go walk you know, you just have to explore and, you know, the, the, the environment will open up to you. Right. Well, we're super excited to see what the Everglades will be giving you starting tomorrow. Everyone go follow G-Day's Instagram if you want some uh, some day-to-day uh, -day reels. And yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And um Helen, do you want to come back on and say goodbye? How does this work? It's so weird. These Zoom things are so weird. I can come back and say goodbye. 
GD, thank you so, so much. Mm -hmm. Esther, thank you. I could listen, watch you two all day, every day. I see a TV show in the future. I'm just, uh, you know. Discovery I'm Channel. Yeah, yes, Discovery <laughs> Channel. I think you should be naked and afraid. I can't believe you were like, oh, Ona GD, you should do that. Esther, I Wait, I, 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 I've already thought about this. And yes, I would <laughs> crush it. I would crush it because I love sleeping nothing more and I would sleep for 22 days straight. Uh, how would you survive sleep? Okay, that's a whole nother TV show that we need to. <laughs> but I wanted to say thank you so much again to everybody. Really appreciate it. And Energy Day, have a wonderful, wonderful residency yes. starting tomorrow. Can't wait to see um, what you get up to down there. And thank, thank you for you. taking the time. All right. We'll Thanks, G-Day. We'll see you soon. Right, thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.